Thanks, everybody. I'm so excited to be here with all of you. And I especially want to thank Congresswoman Judy Chu for joining us. Right after I give my introduction, she'll spend some time talking about some of her most passionate projects surrounding the earth and our environment. And then we'll have, you know, we have a lot of great people from all over our wonderful district. So Earth Day is my favorite day of the year. And I was just remembering that many of you know that we launched our campaign to flip California's eighth congressional district and bring the kind of representation that we all want for our beautiful district and for all the amazing people who live there. We launched our campaign last year on Earth Day. So this day last year, we were just arriving in Joshua Tree. We started at Mono Lake at five in the morning and got to Joshua Tree just around sunset. And you know, one of the reasons I love Earth Day so much is that it gives us time to think about what we've inherited. I'm so grateful to the stewards of all of the land and all of those stewards who came before us. It encourages us to consider mm -hmm. what we'll be leaving behind for the generations who come after us. So when I talk about this campaign and what caused me to want to run for Congress for California's 8th Congressional District, I often talk about healthcare first. And that's because I've shared with many of you that my entire professional background was in healthcare. And it became very personal for me when my daughter had her own struggle with epilepsy as a child. And when I realized how much parents and families went through to try to just get the coverage and care that they need for their family members when they have a condition, the more I realize we have to make sure that everyone in this country has access to health care. And I don't need to tell you any more about that right now. Look where we are today because our health care system doesn't take care of everyone the way it should. So I left my job in 2017 to advocate for trying to preserve the Affordable Care Act and to make mainly help people with pre-existing conditions because that's where I felt so personally that I had seen what happens to people if they don't have the protections they need. What I don't talk about as often is the fact that another thing inspired me to run for Congress, and it's really about this place. It's about our entire district. Obviously, I love my home in Mammoth, but I equally love all of the different parts and have completely fallen in love with the Victorville area where our campaign office is and all the wonderful people who helped us in the primary. But another thing that caused me to think about running was two years ago, my son Sam and I were driving from Mammoth to Bishop one afternoon and a fire had started. And I got very upset because wildfire is something that's a, such a concern to all of us here in California. And I've seen the devastation it can create. And he said to me in the way only an 18 year old could, well, I don't know what you're so upset about. Your generation had the chance to deal with the climate crisis and you didn't. And I thought, well, I'll show you. I'm gonna run for Congress and I'm gonna protect this district. And so, you know, as I mentioned, I got into this race to protect many of the incredible natural treasures we have and to protect the health of the people of this district. And the more that time I've spent talking to people all throughout our wonderful 8th Congressional District, the more I realize that we are much more united than divided in many of the challenges we face. You know, I don't have to tell Kathy Bancroft and she'll be sharing some of her experiences, but Kathy is from the Owens Valley. And one of the things that we've really struggled with in this district over the years is that it's a place where people come to extract natural resources. They come for recreation. People come into our district, but then they don't necessarily help us protect our lands and natural resources the way we should. And the perfect example of this is that 100 years ago, when the Owens River was diverted to create the California Aqueduct, no one was planning for what that would do to those special lands. And as a result, we're still paying the price of that 100 years later. We're not going to let that happen to ourselves and our wonderful 8th Congressional District any longer. We have an opportunity in the future, particularly based on the crisis that we're facing now, 
that we can build an economy that relies on green technology, particularly in our high desert areas around Victorville and in the Mojave Desert, we have unimpeded sun and wind. It's time for us to harness that energy and use it to bring jobs, 21st century jobs, that pay a living wage, that allow people not to have to commute out of our district, and that allow them to have the kinds of pensions that they can retire with dignity, all while making sure we educate our children for the future. So I think it's really important that we take this opportunity, and it can be an opportunity. Yes, we are in a crisis situation. Yes, our economy is under siege and under duress, and particularly in our rural areas, we are going to see challenges that we never dreamed of or expected. But again, we can turn this into opportunity. We can take this time to make sure that as we rebuild, we rebuild with the kind of just economic infrastructure that our district deserves. At the same time, that will allow us to protect our wilderness and public lands in the Sierras, Mono Lake, Death Valley, Joshua Tree, all of the extraordinary places. We can reduce the risk of wildfire, combat the scarcity of water, and figure out how to make it more fair for everybody, all at the same time improving and protecting our air quality. So if there's anything we've learned from these past, I guess, six weeks, it's that we are all in this together. We are one global community. We are interdependent and only when we make things just for everybody will we have the kind of society and world that we all deserve. So thank you so much for joining today. Charlie is now going to play a video that we are trying to recreate our journey from last year, but luckily we have friends all throughout the district who are able to help us since we're all safer at home. Thanks a lot. Take it away, Charlie. Hi, I'm Chris Bubser. On this 50th anniversary of Earth Day, we want to take the opportunity to celebrate the 33,000 square miles of pristine wilderness and beautiful federal lands and the 750,000 strong, hardworking people who make up California's 8th Congressional District. This year, because we're all safer at home, I've asked some friends to help by showing us what's so special about their part of California 8. This is Bishop, a great place to explore. I'm Holly. I'm Kent. And this is the Mojave Desert. The Mojave Desert is... Magical. And a wonderful place to ride mountain bikes. I am Wrightwood, and Wrightwood is gorgeous. Hi, I'm Bob Gardner. And I'm Karen Gardner. We're celebrating Earth Day in June Lake in the Eastern Sierra. This is one of the many spectacular places in California's 8th Congressional District. Hi, I'm Mike and this is Michelle. We're coming to you from Lake Arrowhead in the beautiful San Bernardino Mountains. I'm Kathy and this is Paya Donadu, the traditional homeland of the Numu and Numu people. Paya Donadu is sacred. Hi, I'm Keely and Mammoth is a winter wonderland. I'm Charlie and Joshua Tree is full of life. Este es Mono Lake, el mejor lago para ver aves. This is Mono Lake, a great place to be inspired. I'm Brenda from Oak Glen, and Oak Glen is magical. This is California 8, and California 8 is worth protecting. So again, I'm honored to introduce Representative Judy Chu. Many of you know that Representative Chu's district borders ours across the San Gabriel Mountains. And she has been a champion for environmental causes, actually for all causes of justice. And, as, and I'd also like to say incredibly generous in her encouragement and support of me as I began this race. 
Representative Chu led the establishment of the San Gabriel Mountains National Monument, which um, the far eastern edge of is actually borders on our district. She's also been a leader in the fight against climate change, protection of public lands, and for that and many other reasons, we will be natural allies in Congress. Representative Chu, I also just want to thank you for your courage in calling out this administration and some of the harsh rhetoric they've used against um, people of different ethnicities around this virus that's unacceptable and it's really important that we have voices like yours. So thank you so much for being here and we're just delighted to hear you talk about some of the different bills you've sponsored. Thanks again. Thank you, Chris, for that introduction. I'm so thrilled to be here with Chris and all of you to celebrate Earth Day. 50 years ago, millions of people around the world came together to demand a better future for our planet and for their children. As we all come together in this uncertain and unprecedented time, it's important that we continue to carry these values forward. The stay at home orders really shone a light on the issue of environmental inequality. As everybody is quarantined at home, people in communities of color where there are fewer green spaces on average and where populations are more densely packed have had fewer options for moving around outdoors. And these communities are also more likely to have less clean air, which creates health risks. Today, low-income communities and communities of color have higher exposure to air pollution, are more likely to live near landfills, hazardous waste sites, and other industrial facilities. They are more likely to suffer from lead pointing, poisoning and more, have more limited access to clean water. And as the climate crisis continues to worsen, they are at higher risk for extreme weather events such as storms and heat waves and are less likely to have access to the same recovery resources. The re reality is like that for every region of our country. And there is much work to be done to prepare ourselves for its impact. That's why I introduced HR 5176, the Climate Resiliency Service Corps Act of 2019. The bill would create a new AmeriCorps program that's de dedicated to proactively leading our country's response to climate change. It means educating Americans about the impacts facing more vulnerable communities and responding to climate-related natural disasters like wildfires in California and stronger storms in the Southeast. It would help communities to rebuild in resilient, adaptive ways so we can protect our homes and infrastructure from the dangers posed by a warming climate. I believe that our nation's core members represent the best of us, young people who join a cause bigger than themselves to make a difference in their communities. And they should be at the forefront of this monumental challenge. And with this bill, Congress can give them the support to do just that. I'd also like to talk about an environmental issue that's a big part of my district and also plays an important role in District, uh, district 8. It's so important. Um, we share this border. And in fact, district, uh, Congressional District 8 is on the eastern edge of the San Gabriel Mountain Monument. Now, ever since I got to Congress, I made it my mission to do as much as I could to protect the San Gabriels and preserve their beauty for future generations. And I've always been looking for a partner to work with uh, in Congress in my neighboring district and with Chris Buzzer, we can definitely get that to happen. Well, let me tell you about H.R. 2546, the Protecting America's Wilderness Act passed by Congress uh, earlier this year. The legislation includes the text of my bill, H.R. 2215, the San Gabriel Mountains, Foothills and Rivers Protection Act, which is the result of years of grassroots advocacy and community engagement to improve protections and access for these treasured lands. The San Gabriel Mountains are the crown of the Los Angeles area. They provide 30% of our water, comprise 70% of Los Angeles County's open space, and are home to historic habitat species like the um, California condor and the Nelson's bighorn sheep. And this immense 
natural beauty exists right in the backyard of one of the densest urban areas in our country, offering recreation opportunities like hiking, fishing, camping to the more than 15 million Americans that live nearby. And it is so important because the Los Angeles region is among the most park poor areas in the country, meaning that too many communities don't have access to outdoor recreation opportunities in their own neighborhoods. So it was a major step forward when in 2014, President Obama recognized the decades of grassroots support for this goal and granted my request to designate the San Gabriel Mountains a national monument. Immediately, this made available more resources to the mountains that resulted in cleaner rivers, improved facilities like picnic areas and hiking trails, and more rangers to inter interact with visitors. The same level of resources and protection is needed across the San Gabriel Mountains and in the communities that serve as their gateway. So HR 2456 would build on the success of the National Monument by expanding the monument's boundaries to include the Western Angeles National Forest, establishing new and expanded wilderness areas, and protecting more than 45 miles of waterways as wild and scenic rivers. It would also establish the critical new San Gabriel Mountains National Recreation Area to bolster the connection between urban and wild spaces, helping communities in the foothills and along the river corridor improve access to the mountains and offer new recreation opportunities for Angelinos. This kind of work is exactly why we need Chris Bubser in Congress. For so long, I have not had a partner on that end of the uh, of the district. But with her, I will have a partner that can work with me to make our communities access the resources and protections for our environment and for the San Gabriel Mountains. Um, not someone who says no every step of the way or any step of the way, Chris will fight to defend our environmental treasures and protect against the threats we are facing from climate change. That's because Chris knows that if we do not take action now, the world will look much different by Earth Day's 100th anniversary. So I thank you all for joining us and for supporting Chris Bubster for Congress. I can't wait to have her by my side in Washington, D.C. Thank you so much, Representative Chu. Um, I know you just have a few more minutes left, but if anyone would like to ask a question of the representative, please uh, type it in the chat box or you can unmute yourself and ask the question. Hi, Charlie, it's Rebecca Unger in Joshua Tree. Hi. Hi there. Thank you guys so much for doing this. And uh, thank you, Chris, for running. And thank you, Representative Chu. Uh, I grew up in El Monte at the foothills of the San Gabes, and I was so happy to see those beautiful mountains being cherished and, and uh, protected. So thank you very much. And, uh, you know, out here in Joshua Tree, we're, we're fighting for the same things out here. So I, I, it's hard to imagine. I remember the first Earth Day, and um, here we are, you know, 50 years later, and I hope everyone's noticed just how beautiful and sweet smelling and great tasting the air has been lately <laughs> since we're not on the road and factories aren't spewing stuff out. And I have never in my lifetime ever breathed air this clean. So yeah, we have a lot to fight for. Thank you very much. Thanks, Rebecca. I think uh, we can take one more question, if anyone has one, for Representative Chu. Um, I have a question about uh, uh, the bill that, that's, uh, that's on there. Is, is, is uh, neonicotinoids a, a portion of that where they can't use it in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the area surrounding or in the forest? Um, you mean nicotine in the forest? Uh, neonicotinoids, which is what causes bees to lose their right-left abilities and causes them confusion, causes bees to, uh, and other insects to, 
uh, have, have, have less ability to survive. Therefore, the rare and endangered species that are in the forest don't get pollinated, so they will be lessened. I see. And it's see. called neonicotinoids or neonics. Okay. The, the key you name for neonics is no- neonicotinoids. Neonicotinoids. Okay. Yeah. So, and, uh, and I make- yeah. Yeah. No, I, mean, I will make a note of that. And, and I mean, it's probably not there now, but uh, who knows about the future? And, and uh, I will bring it up with people. Okay. Yeah, that would be really good. Thank you. Who did that question come from? Uh, Glenn Goldstein. Yeah. Hi, Glenn. All right. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to turn it back to Chris. Okay. Representative Chu, thank you so much for joining us. And I will look forward to seeing you very soon and uh, working together. So thanks again. You stay safe and thank Thank you for everything you're doing for our country. Thank you so much. Terrific. So now I would like to introduce Mike Young from California League of Conservation Voters. And I have known California League of Conservation Voters for many, many years because some friends of mine worked for CLCV a long time ago. So I've always admired, supported, and followed CLCV and League of Conservation Voters. And so obviously getting that endorsement was just such a thrill and has really boosted our campaign. So I'd like to turn it over to Mike um, to make some comments about Earth Day. Awesome. Uh, well, well, thank you, Chris. We really appreciate it. We're very excited to be supporting you in your campaign. Uh, you know, I, this, the environment, obviously, we think of every day as Earth Day, uh, but this is the one day in particular where uh, we want everyone else to think about Earth Day in the same way that we do. And, you know, given the circumstances that we're dealing with in, in modern times, um, which admittedly are incredibly strange times, I, I think there, there's been some, you know, good and bad in terms of what the environment is actually looking like. Uh, the, some of the good news is that, that it really, when we talk about how bad the environment can get and uh, the, the crisis that we're dealing with in terms of our public lands and what's happening with our oceans and the climate and all of these issues, the, this was actually a moment where we can see the difference in the impact that humanity makes and what kind of impact we can make when we're more thoughtful and more careful about what those approaches are. Uh, you, if you're looking through some of the, the interesting stories around the world, um, because of uh, social distancing and people staying at home, uh, you're actually seeing a lot of wildlife starting to return to the places that, that um, we you know, used to always think of them as returning to, or they're becoming more visible. Uh, even in, in Yosemite, one of the things that was really exciting was hearing about all the bear sightings that rangers are reporting right now because um, the parks are closed and they're feeling more free to be able to explore and be bears in nature. Uh, and I know a lot of times we go out there and we'd love to see them and that includes myself, um, but it's, it's a thing where it's, uh, there's a trade-off there. Um, and so seeing the human impact, humanity is, is looking at a time when right now uh, we have some of the cleanest air that we've ever had in the last 30 years because people aren't driving. Uh, a lot of uh, manufacturing isn't necessarily happening, but it's also a reminder that the air could be that clean. Like we could actually strive for this goal. Uh, and there's actually a way for us to do both. And when we think about how important um, the, the, this work is and certainly how important Earth Day is and how important um, having a leader like Chris, Chris uh, in Congress would be, uh, that this is uh, the the vision that we we imagine, because currently in, in in Congress there's there's clearly a divide in leadership on the environment. Um, we wish that weren't the case. Uh, we we long for the days when the environment was not a partisan issue at all. Um, but we are definitely seeing it, and in this race in particular, there's an enormous contrast between um, Chris and her opponent, who we've gotten to know um, over the time that he's spent in the state legislature. Uh, when we think about this uh, this district, uh, you know, we think certainly, as always, we think about climate and, and the impacts and the importance of that um, having somebody who's really not only going to be not a climate denier, uh, but really going to be active in trying to figure out how to 
build sustainable energy, how to transition us away from fossil fuels, um, how to really build the, the economic structure in California um, that has benefited from uh, investment in clean energy. Uh, we, we look, look to look, uh, compare and contrast in this race. Uh, you know, Chris is somebody who, who's really being thoughtful and trying to figure out how do we, uh, how do we move ourselves there? How do we get, uh, how do we address climate? And how do we uh, transition to a clean energy future? Well, her opponent uh, has actually been, had a, uh, a pretty horrific record in the state legislature. Uh, he currently has a 16% environmental score. Um, that's actually even lower than the average of his caucus, uh, which is really horrifying when you think about it from those terms. Uh, and when you think about the trade-off of, of the types of issues that we're talking about, you know, public lands are such an important part to the climate. And they're such an important part to this district. Uh, you know, I think throughout this call, uh, we've been talking, and, and throughout the video, people are talking about all their favorite places in the district. And really, when, uh, all, the, all the wonderful places like Joshua Tree, Mojave Desert, Death Valley, um, all these wonderful places that we, we can enjoy um, and be a part of. And yet all of that is under threat because there are really, there's surprisingly two philosophies that shouldn't exist. One that says basically all of it's there for extraction. And one that says that we can be thoughtful about how we can, how we enjoy and protect these lands. Uh, and also um, you consider it as part of a, an important resource that we have. And so, uh, one really important contrast uh, in that that we think about is uh, the Cadiz project, which we are really excited that um, that Chris is is an opponent to to Cadiz, and exactly right. It's 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 a real it's a real problem um, because there's no reason why this company that's been at this for decades should be getting th this special permit uh, and trying to get access to water that would just utterly destroy the desert. But what's even more telling is that her opponent in the state legislature opposed every step of the way the bill to actually make sure that there was proper environmental review. We're not even talking about a bill that passes and it stops the project. All we are actually asking for is there to be an actual thorough environmental review of the, the impact of this project because the Cadiz Incorporated had been lying about their numbers and we knew that. But if they let people know that they were lying about how much water they would extract, no one would ever pass this pro program. So we said, look, we're not even asking you to stop it. We're just saying, take a look. And her opponent in the state legislature was like, no, we don't even wanna do that. Like that's, like, that's not important. Like this, this is just getting in the way uh, of, I guess this company that's been trying this for, for decades. Uh, and that's just not an acceptable or okay thing for, for anyone to be thinking about how policy should move forward. Uh, we're seeing it again now, actually, there's another storage, uh, there's an Eagle Crest project with a, a, similar, a similar attempt as the Cadiz project, um, trying to get the same water <laughs> uh, and, and uh, trying to, to, to once again say like, oh, we deserve to privatize this water. Uh, but, you know, again, these are resources that everyone should be able to enjoy, and they're actually integral to the sustaining the important places like Joshua Tree. So it just makes no sense. Uh, and so we really appreciate having somebody who's going to be a completely different leader. And then when we think about other issues that are really critical to, to this district right now, um, you're talking about something like the Land and Water Conservation Fund, um, which California has, has, has benefited from $2.5 billion over the course of the last 50 years um, uh, that helps fund all of, our state par uh, all of our state parks, beaches, trails. Um, it's been a really amazing program. And it used to be a very strong bipartisan program and something has changed. <laughs> something has just very sadly changed where trying to move this bill has become much more difficult than it's ever been. Um, we, we were successful in being able to pass it uh, to restore funding or to, to permanently institute it as a program again because um, the Trump administration had actually nixed the program altogether. Um, however, there's no agreement on funding the program. So now it's just, uh, another program that we're, we're trying to figure out, yes, we're glad that you now recognize that this bipartisan program that everyone benefits from is great, um, but this is a program that also needs to be funded in order for it to work. And we, I'm not nearly as confident that uh, Chris's opponent will be somebody who will actually be a champion for this, despite the, all the millions and millions of dollars that actually the Congressional 8th District benefits um, from all of, all of its public places for, for a program like this. So, yeah, we, we look at this, uh, um, this race as really a really critical race for, for public lands and the environment, environmental protection. 
And we I really appreciate Chris, you jumping into the race and having a candidate who can be really thoughtful, who's addressing issues like from mining to public lands, to climate, to clean energy, um, that we really need to be tackling, not just in this district, but as a state and as a country. Uh, and that's just something that you're not seeing from the other, other candidate. And really, it's, this is a really very clear contrast between two visions of leadership, um, one that we're really proud to be standing behind um, and one that would be disappointing uh, as an understatement. Thank you so much, Mike. Um, I think that we'll do Q&A at the end. Is that right, Charlie? So we should just go on to our next uh, speaker. Yep. So great. So thanks again. And next we have a group of people, and this is one of my favorite things that can happen across the 8th Congressional District because we have people from Lee Vining, Mono Lake, and that is Ben Trafri. Did I say your name right, Ben? and Kaylin McQuilkin. And then we also have Don Condon from Mammoth and Quinton Lake from the high desert area. Quinton, you live in Apple Valley, is that correct? And so they all together are members of CCL, which is Citizens Climate Lobby, a bipartisan organization that's working to find innovative ways to address climate change. It's an or another organization that I have followed and admired for quite some time. So we're just delighted that you all could be here together to talk about the issues across our district and some of the legislation that you're all supporting. So thanks for joining us. Thanks, Chris. I'm uh, going to show a couple of uh, short videos from Citizens Climate Lobby, and then we'll get started with their I'm on the agenda. The climate is changing. Extreme weather is disrupting livelihoods and food supplies around the world. This is observed. This is documented. This is the scientific community's consensus. The climate is changing. Carbon emissions are driving that change. Emissions come from burning fossil fuels. So if we want to slow or even reverse the change, we must lower our fossil fuel use. By charging a fee on fossil fuels and returning that revenue to households as a dividend, we can do just that. Starting a chain of positive effects. Fossil fuels become less desirable. Cleaner sources of energy become more competitive. The dividend creates millions of jobs. Carbon emissions go down, reduced air pollution saves tens of thousands of lives, and climate change is brought under control. We can make this happen, but enacting a carbon fee and dividend isn't in our hands, it's in theirs. How do we sway them? What can we do? We can use our voices to express political will and demand action. We must help our elected leaders work together. It's on us to tell them what we want as a group. Because when voices call out together, their impact multiplies. Government can respond to the will of the people, provided we tell the government what we want. And what we want is a livable world. This is what Citizens Climate Lobby works for. To empower citizens to connect with and influence their members of Congress. To spread the idea that each one of us can address climate change. Bring your voice to citizensclimatelobby.org. All right, and one more. Today, I'm lobbying Congress on climate change. Just being here in general makes me really excited, so um, this is going to be really fun. I'm really excited to see what the outcome is going to be. This is kind of something I've always wanted to do, but it's really nerve-wracking because it's such an important task and I feel like I have a lot of pressure because I really care about what I'm doing. So far the teams have been very supportive of my first time. It just feels exhilarating, just getting a chance to work together and it just change some lives. We all bring something to the table and uh, we all have our own talents and when we all bring them together we can really make a change. I feel pretty hopeful. 
was ready to go back to the district and continue to meet with them and continue to show up in their office and let them know that we're going to keep coming back. I just had a very successful lobby meeting and it looks like we may have a co-sponsorship. It's so great to see just the positive response we've gotten to the bill and to CCL in general. It feels incredible. It was so unbelievable to hear that they will probably do it today. All right. Um, love those videos. Um, John and Quentin, if you could uh, start your video or unmute yourself, um, we'd love to hear from you. I am I am unmuted. Is uh, Don there? Don, to unmute, press star six. Okay, I don't know where Don's at. Um, Looks like he might be on now. Okay. Don, are you there? Yeah, can you hear me now? You can. Hello? Great. Yeah. Great. Um, You're on, Don. Okay, thanks. Hi, Quentin and Ben and Kalen. Uh, I want to uh, just go over the Energy, Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act slide. Uh, but before I do that, I just want to mention that uh, CCL is a uh, international organization, and uh, we have over 180,000 members in uh, the USA. And our primary uh, function is to create the political will to put a price on carbon, to reduce our carbon emissions. Uh, in order to do that, we lobby Congress two times a year in DC and uh, also frequently in their home offices. We also work with the media. We write letters to the editor and op-eds. Uh, we table and outreach uh, to the public to uh, try to educate uh, them on our goals. And our goal is, is fairly simple. Um, we need to price the external cost of carbon and uh, get that money uh, out to the people. So uh, looking at the slide, uh, the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act is, first of all, it's bipartisan. We don't favor Republicans or Democrats. We just favor moving towards a climate solution. And uh, how we do that is, um, we charge a fee on fossil fuels at the source, either at the uh, pump or the wellhead or the mine. That money that's collected on an annual basis is returned 100% as a dividend to all American households. Now, it starts off at $15 per month per year and then goes up $10 a year I mean, uh, sorry, $15 per ton. And it goes up uh, $10 per ton every year. Uh, it's a very uh, aggressive approach and will encourage uh, innovation in other, other energy sources. Uh, how does this benefit uh, people in the economy? Well, after 10 years, the average family will receive 4400 $4,410, and uh, it will create a lot of jobs. The other aspect is that 80% of uh, low- and middle-income households will, will end up with more money in their pockets than it cost them as a result of the, uh, the fee on carbon. And uh, finally, we'll create 2.1 million jobs and uh, create a healthier environment. Uh, today, we lose 114,000 lives each year because of the air pollution. Uh, in the future, because the air will be cleaner, we'll save 295,000 lives every year. And finally, uh, with this plan, we would reduce carbon uh, 
by 40% in 12 years, which is roughly in line with the Paris, the Paris uh, Treaty. So um, looking at this, uh, I just want to mention that uh, this was put on, originally introduced by Ted Deutsch and Francis Rooney of Florida. I want to give a shout out to Judy too, because she was one of our original co-sponsors of this bill. And uh, finally, um, I just want to mention that uh, once again, it's a bipartisan and revenue neutral bill. In other words, when I say revenue neutral, it's not going to grow the government at all. Uh, and uh, as George Schultz, who was uh, one of the, uh, who was the Secretary of State for Ronald Reagan, said, uh, "It's not a tax." If the government doesn't keep the money, so this is a, this is not a tax. People will call it that, but because the money is going to be returned to all households, it's basically a uh, revenue neutral bill. Uh, Quentin, do you have anything to add? And uh, if not, I'll let uh, Ben and uh, Kalen talk a little bit about their experience lobbying in D.C. last June. That would be great. Uh, did you have that slide also of us in Washington? Yeah, Charlie, can you show that slide to the picture? There you are. There we are. That was in front of P Congressman Cook's office um, last June. Um, that was Everybody there except the far left who uh, is the conservative caucus uh, guy from uh, of CCL in uh, California, uh, or Southern California at least. And um, the rest of us are all from uh, California 08. Um, and uh, Ben is way over there. Uh, he's the second from the left and he'll be talking in a second. And then Kayleen is two over from me and behind my uh, wife. And uh, they'll both be talking uh, here in a minute and talking about their experience. This is the second time I went to Washington, D.C. Uh, and we did, we, we talked to staff. We, we always meet with staff when it comes to Congressman Cook. Um, uh, he hasn't uh, given his, his personal time, but their staff agreed to meet with us. And so we meet and we, we share our views and, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't know if we're gain, gaining any head away with them, but I, I sure hope that I get to do it with Chris, uh, come and talk to Chris in the future. So that's my, my hope. Um, anyhow, I'm gonna hand it off to uh, Ben and Kayleen to talk about their experience in Washington. Thanks, Quentin. Uh, ben and uh, Kayleen, why don't you go ahead and start your video? Uh, it'd be great to see you. Uh, so I just unmuted, but um, I'm not allowed to start video. Yeah, me too. All right, just a moment. <laughs> okay. There you go. All right. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Kaylin McQuilkin. I'm from Levining, Mona Lake, um, in the district, and I graduated from Levining High School just last year. So that's my connection to the area. And I'm Ben Treffrey. I'm a graduating senior this year at Levining High School. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll go right into talking about the Citizens Climate Lobby Conference, which last year, actually seven of us from Levining High School were able to attend, thanks to a bunch of generous donations from Citizens Climate Lobby and from members of the community. So we're really thankful for that. And being there with thousands of other CCL members, really impressed upon us how unique and really impressive an organization Citizens Climate Lobby is and how unique their mission is as well. Uh, before getting to know CCL, I always thought of lobbying and lobbyists as these evil corporate manipulation strategies. Then I became a lobbyist with Citizens Climate Lobby and I realized that actually it's a way to empower citizens to lobby their representatives to make real positive change. So that that was a really awesome realization for me that that we could do this like reach out to our representatives in that way and 
Yeah, it was a, a great time. We learned a lot. And Citizens Climate Lobby's mission to, to be bipartisan and really work with both Republicans and Democrats is a great way to address making change in our, in our district because our district has a diverse range of political views. Um, so Kaylin's going to talk about next how we how we prepared to meet with um, representatives that that we were lobbying, particularly we met with staff of Paul Cook. Yeah, so a big part of making sure that CCL is able to be that great lobbying group that lobbies in a very constructive and respectful way has to do with how the lobbyists lobby. So we did a lot of planning before our meetings and we're focusing on the one with Paul Cook this time. So there were five of us or six of us constituents from the district, five of us younger students. And um, so we sort of followed like a model that CCL gives us for how to effectively lobby, which was we started out by introducing ourselves and talking a bit about our connection to the district because the fact that we're constituents and some of us are gonna be voters soon is a pretty big deal. Um, so we did that and then um, another thing that CCL emphasizes as Ben was saying is sort of like reaching out to people with differing political ideologies and stuff. So we made sure to complement one thing that we appreciated that the representative had done, um, whether it was related to the environment or some other thing that they had done that helped the district. And then we sort of got into introducing CCL and its nonpartisan approach and explaining a bit about the bill and how it would help our environment. Um, so yeah, that was our basic planning. And then Ben will go into talking about how the meeting went. Yeah, so we met with a, a staff member of Paul Cook. Um, he hasn't agreed to meet with us yet, as Quinton said. And oh, I see Charlie just dropped the citizensclimatelobby.org link. Thanks. Check that out. It's a great organization. Um, yeah, so it was, I'm not going to lie, it was challenging to communicate. You know, we're, even though Citizens Climate Lobby is a nonpartisan organization, it's still the sense that um, Republicans are a lot less likely to be on board with climate action. And it was um, quite challenging to communicate with a, you know, a staffer of a, a Republican congressman. Um, but we still, we still managed to, you know, get our, our concerns across and have a, a positive exchange. Um, and the, the main concern that the, the staffer brought up, which is actually quite relevant is um, because it, things are so far apart in our district here, people drive maybe more than average, so that an increase in gas prices will affect our district, perhaps disproportionately. Yeah, so then some of our, we just wanted to talk about some of our takeaways from lobbying Paul Cook in the conference. I mean, overall, it was an awesome experience. The fact that eight of us kids got to go to DC and make our voices heard and call for action. It was probably one of the coolest things that I've ever done. And it was great that we got to be there without having to pay too much thanks for to the awesome people in our district. Um, and so, yeah, it felt like a really constructive way to get involved in government processes, which I feel like we don't really see a lot of today. So it was awesome that CCL gave us that chance to do that. Um, at the same time, we, it, like Ben said, the meeting was a little frustrating. It was hard to get our points across. And so we sort of left the meeting with a bigger understanding of why it's really important to elect a representative who's very receptive to organizations like CCL and very aware of the climate crisis that our world is going through right now. And so this is a really big part of the reason why we were all super excited when we heard that Chris started her campaign for Congress and a big part of the reason why we're all very supportive of her. Um, and we're super excited about how we might be able to make a bigger impact in our district uh, through CCL in the future. Um, thank you. I, I would okay. like to add something real quick oh, that, that and uh, Paul Cook was not the only uh, representative that we got to go see. Each of us got to see uh, either three, maybe four different uh, congressional offices because we just bounced around. We kind of helped other groups. And so they probably all of them had a very pleasant experience at one of their uh, other groups that they met, other congressional staff that they met, or even possibly met 
Congress people. Uh, so uh, it wasn't just dealing with Congressman Cook. So there was a little bit of um, getting to meet people that made you a little more inspired. I mean, Congress people that are made you a little more inspired. Yeah, definitely. Um, I actually, I got to meet with a representative face to face and that was a really great experience because we had a, our, our lobbying team was, you know, some, there were some other um, young people in it that were, I think there might've been one or two other uh, high school students that were sent by a travel ship as, as we were, you know, um, funded by CCL to go there. And yeah, it was, a, it was really positive because she didn't know about um, Citizens Climate Lobby yet. So we weren't just preaching to the choir, but we did, by the end, we felt like she was really supported cause, supportive because our, our lobby team, you know, just worked really well together. And, and we really had a great conversation with her as well as getting our point across. So that's the, that is the, the power of lobbying. It's not just for oil companies. <laughs> Yeah, it was awesome to see a wide range of representatives and their reactions to um, what we were saying for CCO. And it gave us a lot of hope for what we could also see with our district in the future. Awesome. Well, we certainly hope that uh, the next group of young folks coming from California will be meeting with Chris uh, next year in DC. Um, and I'm pledging right now, it will be with me personally. <laughs> because if young people go to the trouble to come all the way across the country, then I would happily sit down to hear what their concerns are. So thank it's you so much. Record. Yeah. It's good to hear. <laughs> and thank you for getting involved because this is the only way we take back our democracy, we change things to be the way that we know they can be. So thanks. Yeah, thanks for having us. And I'm really excited about your campaign. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks, Ben, Kaylin, uh, Don, and Quentin. Um, I want to bring it back to, um, back from DC, back to uh, the 8th and invite um, Alexandria Ortega to speak a bit. I apologize that she's not joining by video. I think she's on the phone. Uh, Alexandria, you can unmute by pressing star six. I'm going to share a photo of uh, the climate strike that you organized um, in Apple Valley. Alexandria, are you there? I'll give her just a second here. All right, Alexandria, looks like you are unmuted. Go ahead. Hmm, we are not able to hear you. <clears throat> but we definitely want to hear from you. Um, so let's uh, take a beat. And um, I'd like to bring up our next speaker, um, who is Kathy Bancroft. Uh, from the Alabama Hill Stewardship Society. And Chris, do you want to introduce Kathy? Yes, thank you so much. And we'll come back to Alexandria. I was lucky enough to meet Kathy. Kathy, I can't even remember when we first met, but I have had the privilege of Kathy teaching me so much about the part of our district that was originally known as Payahunadu. Did I get it right, Kathy? Perfect. <laughs> I've been practicing. Good job. <laughs> Thank you. And Kathy is an incredible uh, his, tribal historian, steward of the land, lover of the beautiful area that is Paya Hunaru. And she will talk a little bit about years, decade of work that was done to protect the Alabama Hills and many other incredible things. So I'll turn it over to you, Kathy, and I'm just so grateful that you're able to join us on this special day. Well, thank you, Chris. Um, I was just enjoying myself sitting here listening to all these wonderful stories and these positive uh, viewpoints on the environment and what can be done, because that's what I like to see. I like to see, you know, people with visions on 
on how do we make it better? Because there is a way. And that's what I've learned. Um, I work, I guess I could, my, my job for the Lone Pine Pike Shoshone Reservation is as the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer. So my job is to protect the cultural resources. And as cultural resources, a lot of people think, you know, it's just the little artifacts that people go out and look for and things. But cultural resources are actually all of the plants, the animals, everything from the earth to the sky. And because these are all important, these are all what we need to survive in, on this earth. And my family, my ancestors, for thousands and thousands of years, have known this valley. We've been in the same place. We, um, we've taken care of this place and we know what it can provide for us. We have everything we need here. And I'm very proud of the fact, I always tell people that when I wake up in the morning, I look, I look out and I'm looking at the same thing my ancestors have looked at, the same view. And how many people can say that? And what's really neat is that it, it is pretty much unchanged. It's a little scary when things start to change. And um, what I've noticed over my lifetime, I was really lucky because I grew up, you know, when there was relatively fewer people around here. And um, I was lucky enough to spend my summers in the Sierras and my winters down here in the Valley. And uh, with my family and friends that I grew up with, but it wasn't until, you know, we can sit here and, and there's a lot of negative things about this pandemic. But I look around and I say, my God, I've never seen the sky this blue since I was a child. And I was young and I always think about, will I ever see that again? We worked really hard to, to try to protect the Alabama Hills because they were getting impacted over 10 years of legislation. Uh, to designate it as a national scenic area. And we thought that would provide some protection, but what we saw was the impact of more and more people coming and thinking of that, of this place as their backyard, their, play, their playground, that they could do whatever they want because they're public lands. And so that entitles them to do whatever they want. But that being public lands means it belongs to everybody. And you have to have everybody in mind, all of the consideration of, of everybody's interests. And that's what, when we did the legislation, that's what we tried. There was some interest in making it a national park or a national monument. And being from Inyo County, where um, almost 99% of the land is federal land, or you know it's not private, and uh, we know that national parks and monuments limit your access to those lands. And that's always a concern with people around here. We wanted to protect everybody's right to use it. But that comes with a huge responsibility. And we were having problems because people aren't willing to take that responsibility to really protect these places that, that we hold so dear. And the local people are just, you know, at the end of their wits doing what is going on. When this uh, pandemic hit and the stay at home orders, we thought, oh, that'll help. It actually made things worse because we had people coming up here to uh, run away from the virus or hide out from it or just, and, and thinking that, oh, here's a place we can get away. Well, maybe at one time, but not when that we've got hundreds of you coming up here. We um, uh, live up here, we're relatively isolated, but we have a large, uh, population of of tourists and visitors going through here and, and making this a destination spot. You talk about um, compromised health and because of the water situation, because of the way LADWP has pumped this valley dry, we all have compromised health from the dust we breathe and and you know from the dryness of this valley. So we're all subject to um, really bad effects and if this virus was to hit here. So there was a lot of concern. And I really have to commend our, um, all of our uh, agencies and entities around here because BLM, uh, Fish and Wildlife, Inyo County, all work together to um, really enforce this closure. 
they worked hard to get the Alabama Hills actually designated as a uh, developed area at first, and that didn't work. And, this, and they actually went through and told everybody they have 24 hours to go to get out of here, to leave. And Inyo County basically closed the county. But what they didn't do, because a lot of people live in their RVs, a lot of people have no place else to go. They actually made uh, camp, a campground in Bishop and one down here in Lone Pine, if they had no place to go. So it, that compassion was showing. And people were saying, it's not very nice of you to tell us to leave. We'll come back when this is over and we'll still be here then. But, you know, I just really want to thank the people who really bought into that and, um, and, and listened when they realized that they weren't helping. Um, it's nice because our businesses are having a hard time. It's nice that the local people are supporting our businesses in this hard time. But um, it's really neat to see. But the best thing about it is when I, I took a ride out there um, just to check on things. And when you see in the short amount of time that people have been discouraged from going out and doing whatever they want on the land, it hasn't taken long and you can see the vegetation recovering. The flowers are coming up. The vegetation where it's been trampled for so long is all coming back. The birds and the butterflies are everywhere. And it's just amazing to see and it just shows how little it would take to heal this earth because that's what it's doing is healing and we can help it heal. And that, that's what I think is what our focus needs to be because um, that's our job is to take care of this earth. It takes care of us. It provides for us. It can't do that if we keep destroying it. So um, I don't know, I could sit here and go on forever, but I know we're running short on time. So um, I'd be glad to answer any questions. I'm always in Lone Pine. It's, it's not hard to find me in Lone Pine, ask Chris. <laughs> and uh, I really appreciate Chris coming up here and taking an interest because a lot of, of people, especially the politicians, were invisible. You know, there aren't that many of us, but we are voters too, and we care. And, you know, like my family's lived here for thousands of years, but a lot of us in Lone Pine, our families have lived here for generations and whether we're indigenous to this country or not, we all care. And so um, we'd appreciate if the visitors came here, cared as much. And I thank Chris for helping us all get that message out and showing that um, we do all care and there are a lot of good things going on. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. I think Charlie's going to take it over from here, but thanks for sharing those thoughts. And yes, everybody stay on for the end because um, Kathy can answer your questions. And if you ever want to, uh, there's an amazing farmer's market on Friday nights in the summer. <laughs> and we, I, I'd ha be happy to meet any of you there because it's a great group of you. Great. Well, thank you, Kathy. And um, Alexandria, I've unmuted your line. Are you there? Can you hear me? We sure can. All right. Okay. <laughs> cool. Um, I'd like to start off by thanking Chris for giving me a chance to speak. I've always been really impassioned about the environment. I grew up being able to enjoy the natural beauty of California. From the Mojave Desert to Death Valley, there are so many environments that need to be protected. Carbon emissions have been steadily on the rise, and even though we should be focused on our studies, we as students feel we must turn our attention to the environment and to climate change. We feel we can no longer trust some of our elected officials to hold our best interests at heart. I go to Granite Hills High School, and last year on the 11th of October, myself and about 50 students stood outside in the cold wind to protest a lack of progress regarding climate policies in Congress. This was on a Friday and we were hoping it would attract more attention if it was following after the Fridays for the Future movement kickstarted by Greta Thunberg. Next year, we will be taking what we learned from the last climate walkout and we will be working to have a more productive and effective walkout. This is the earth we will inherit and we will not stand by and watch as opportunity after opportunity is passed up for economic growth and not environmental recovery. We want to see action being taken to secure our future. We don't wanna hear promises. 
We want ecosystems to be preserved and we want more sustainable and environmentally friendly energy options. We want to see lakes being restored, not drained and dried. We want to see projects like those at Climeworks being utilized to their fullest potential. At Climeworks, they specialize in filtering out CO2, so in large areas, in areas where there are large amounts of CO2 emissions, um, they can actually suck some of that out of the air and restore it to a natural balance. Um, when it comes to the environment to our planet, there's no economic cost that can outweigh the benefits of protecting the only source of life that is currently attainable, our planet. After the walkout, we were so excited for Chris to give us another opportunity to show how important this was to us when she offered to put a few photos of the walkout up on her Instagram page. She showed us, even as a congressional candidate, that she's concerned about the same things we are concerned about. Thankfully, because of the quarantine, carbon emissions have drastically decreased. A current concern, though, that we face is once the quarantine is over, how do we plan to keep emissions and pollutants down? How do we allow our Earth to continue to heal? Thank you so much for letting me speak. <laughs> Thank you, Alexandria. Um, it's so great to hear the work that you all are doing. And I know Chris is um, so grateful to be able to promote the actions that you all are taking. Um, I want to be there next year for the walkout if I'm allowed on campus. I guess I better check first. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, we'll have to see what we can do about that. <laughs> great. Okay, so last but very much not least, um, I wanted to invite uh, Scott Brown to uh, share a bit with us about the work that he's doing with High Desert Keepers um, uh, here in the High Desert part of California's A. And then we're going to uh, open it up for some uh, brief question and answer. And uh, so go ahead, Scott. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Happy uh, Earth Day. Um, it's one of the few things that's uh, close to as old as I am, not quite. Anyway, I am the president and founder of the High Desert Keepers. We're a uh, nonprofit organization here in the High Desert. Uh, we're headquartered in Pinion Hills. And what we do is we go out and clean up illegally dumped trash in the desert, which as some of you know, is a pretty serious problem. Um, if you've driven through the desert or if you live up here, uh, you've seen it, it's, uh, it's just, there are really no words to describe it. Um, to date, we're, well, we're about three years old and we've managed to clean up 208 and a half tons of trash. Um, unfortunately, we're not gonna make our goal this year because the virus kind of shut us down. Um, I'm still running out and doing little things, but uh, we're not having any big group events, obviously. Uh, our goal was to hit 300 tons by the end of our season, which is in May. Uh, we shut down from May through October because it's hot and the snakes are out. And I go out and clean up trash because I'm not smart enough to stay inside where it's cool. But uh, we don't have the big projects. Um, we, uh, we've got about 90, 80 to 90 volunteers. We generally go out on the weekends twice a month uh, for a Saturday and Sunday for four hours a day. Uh, and we clean up trash and on average we'll do anywhere from five to 12 tons of trash on a weekend. Um, we get dumpsters donated to us by uh, the local trash company, CRNR, and it's also through the Phelan Pinion Hills Community Services District. Um, we do do work in Victorville, Hesperia. They take care of the dumpsters for us when we do work in those areas, which is good because they're six to $800 per dumpster. It gets rather pricey and, and uh, that's a big help to us because we don't, we cannot afford that. Um, money is a big thing to us. We don't get any uh, sponsorships or we don't get any money from the state. We don't get any money from the county. Um, most of the money that we get, in fact, all the money we get is, is uh, donations from individuals and businesses locally. Uh, a lot of the businesses will donate lunch for our volunteers because we always feed the volunteers. Um, we, uh, the, the dumping that takes place up here in the desert, we believe 
the majority of it is being done by unlicensed contractors. Uh, people that you see out in front of Home Depot and advertise on Craigslist. Uh, people hire them, uh, they pay them, they give them money to go to the dump and they drive out in the desert and dump it, pocket the money. Um, there are a few other uh, sources from this dumping, uh, Redders, where the landlord doesn't give them a dump card and they don't want to pay their dump fees at the dump and they'll go out and dump household trash. Um, and we have some very good ideas and ways of catching these people. We have caught a few and we've put a couple of places out of business. Uh, once, we, once we find out who they are, we make it very, very public and uh, it, it hurts their business, which is exactly what we, we would like to see. Um, but again, you know, all these programs that we want to put into place, it costs money. So we're working on it. We're working on it very, very hard. Our, our goal is to put ourselves out of business. And uh, uh, so we're just moving forward with that. We, we have some really good programs for some of the other issues, such as tires. Tires are a huge problem for us. Um, there's literally tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of tires out here in the desert. And we have a program that would work very, very well. In fact, I would challenge anybody that if, if we could get this program funded within five years, you would not find a tire in this desert. And uh, so we're trying to work with the state on that. And again, unfortunately, the virus has kind of shut down any efforts that we can make right now. And if, if it weren't for the virus, I'd be in Sacramento right now, roaming the halls and knocking on doors. But uh, we, we're just gonna have to wait that one out a little bit. Um, we, you know, we work with AmeriCorps, uh, which is a fantastic group. We work with Transition Habitat Conservancy as well, which is the local land trust here. Um, the Mojave Land Trust is another group that we work with as well, who uh, just do fantastic things. Um, we are licensed, we're not licensed, we're contracted with the CAL FIRE inmate crews, which is another thing that we're gonna be using a great deal of probably through the summer. Uh, during the winter, um, if they're not on a fire. Um, so that's pretty much who we are and what we do. Um, we're just really trying very hard to clean it up and put a stop to it. Because the desert up here, as you all know, is an incredibly beautiful place. And it's, it affects, it's horrible for the environment. It's horrible for the critters. It affects property values. Uh, immensely. I mean, imagine trying to sell a house, driving through some of these places where there's just literally tons of trash uh, all over the place. So, and, and that's not an exaggeration. Uh, we're, we have our website, of course, which is uh, highdesertkeepers.org, and we're on Facebook. And if you really want to get an idea, if you're not familiar with what the problem looks like, go to our Facebook page and watch the videos, because there's lots and lots and lots of video. Uh, of the problem and of our projects and you know what we do and how we do it. So that's basically it. Awesome. Well, go ahead, Chris. Oh, thank you so much, Scott. And I was so delighted when I first met you to hear about the work you're doing. And when we had the uh, coalition of different environmental groups in Victorville, I guess, gosh, it was two months ago already, the thing that I was most impressed by, and I think Charlie and anybody who did the desert uh, in our video showed, the desert is such a living place, even though when you first look, it, you know, it looks like there's a the few different kinds of scrub brushes, but no, when you dig deeper, and especially during wildflower season, the numbers and types of wildflowers we have, and desert tortoises, and it, it, the, the desert's teeming with life, and the garbage that people dump, it just destroys it. And so I was delighted to know about your work. I was horrified to know it was necessary. I can't wait to work together to, you know, find a new purpose for Desert Keepers that isn't about cleaning up trash anymore because there's still plenty of work to do. Well, there is. I have plans, as you know. We've talked yes. about a few things. Exactly. And I'm disappointed that I didn't get to go count the tortoises this year, so I better get to do it next year. Oh, that's right. Yep. Well, shoot for next year. Yeah, absolutely. So thank you for that. And I think Charlie wants to talk a little bit about how people can get involved. So I want to make sure, Charlie, you get the chance to do that, and then we'll answer any questions. Sure, do. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Scott. And thanks to all the speakers. 
Um, <clears throat> before we get to our q and A, I've got our um, some opportunities to get involved with the campaign. You know, we've heard about um, some of the legislation that the representative uh, Chu has been working on, um, some of the priorities that the the League of Conservation has been advocating, and some of the reasons why we really need Chris in office. Um, and this is how we make it happen. Uh, talking to our friends and neighbors. We have a, a tricky situation right now, but just as we're all talking here, we can get together with our friends and neighbors or our Rotary Club or whatever groups that we might be um, affiliated with. And I wanna really encourage you to host a virtual coffee. Um, I'm not sure if you can uh, highlight the link there that I've shared, but um, there's a form that I will also put in the chat box you can uh, sign up to host a virtual coffee. Really easy. You get the friends. We'll uh, set up the Zoom link. I promise it won't have all the same uh, technical issues we had at the top of our meeting today. And there'll be a chance for folks to meet Chris, share their concerns, and um, hopefully go and host their own virtual coffee. Or after we're allowed to um, uh, mingle with one another again, host it right at their home with actual coffee. So that is the best thing that folks can be doing to advance um, Chris's campaign right now. A few other opportunities. You can make wellness calls to folks around the district. We have a, we're using the phone banking technology that we use to get out the vote to reach um, folks over 55, check in with them, make sure that they have access to the resources they're looking for or that they need and uh, pointing them in the right direction if they don't. And um, also encouraging them to make sure they complete the census and inviting them to volunteer if they would like to do that as well. You can sign up for any range of volunteer activities, be it right now or down the line, knocking on doors, making phone calls at chrisbubster.com slash volunteer. And um, you know, if you have a group that meets regularly and is doing it online right now or doing it in person later down the road, uh, Chris would love to speak. You can just email me, that's charlie at chrisbubzer.com and I will uh, work with you to get it set up at the time it works for you guys. So those are some of the ways that you can get involved. I'm gonna um, turn it back over um, to the group. Um, I saw one raised hand that is no longer there but if you'd like to ask a question, go ahead and um, click um, uh, raise your hand in the, in the chat box um, or in the participant list, or go ahead and unmute yourself and ask away. We've got about uh, five or so minutes to get a few questions in. If hey, Charlie and Chris, this is Yaney from Hi. Bishop. And I have a couple of questions. I'd like you to send out those links via email to the conference because I can't copy and paste them. And it's kind of a segue, but what about the post office running out of money? I'm so glad you asked that question. You know, it's interesting, but from the very beginning of our campaign, we sought out the postal service and the Postal Service historically has provided rural communities like ours with incredible services. I mean, you know, there are some of us who remember that postal banking used to be a way that people could, you know, deposit and cash their checks and they wouldn't have to go to payday lenders and things like that. Obviously, those of us in our remote towns are so grateful for the Postal Service right now. And the other thing is that vote by mail is the way of the future to make sure that people can vote during difficult times like pandemics safely, but also that they, you know, we would then have a paper record that their vote was counted. It's, there are so many reasons why we have to protect the postal service. So we have sent out a petition asking people to support our postal service and we've also you know in anything we can do as a candidate as opposed to being a member of Congress we're doing so but you know certainly if you uh, want to help with those efforts we are working with as I mentioned very there are a few different unions so the postal supervisors the letter carriers 
and um, postal workers. And then there's other labor groups, uh, other unions like Layuna that represents some postal workers as well. We have asked them to loop us in to any actions, phone calling, or any kind of outreach we can do to elected officials because we have to make sure this doesn't happen. Yep. Thanks, Chris. I've got a couple questions uh, here. Uh, first, uh, Carla Callums, I've unmuted you, go ahead. Yes, hi, thank you for, um, for hosting this town hall. It's very interesting. I'm with the San Bernardino Mountains Land Trust. And we have some uh, local issues here on the mountain, just like what Scott was talking about. We have a lot of illegal dumping. We've cleaned up a lot of properties, a lot of reserves and preserves to protect uh, endangered and threatened species, uh, plant species and animal species like the Southern rubber boa, um, California spotted owl, um, the uh, flying squirrel, and um, some of the uh, plant species that are only here in the Big Bear area, they exist nowhere else, called the Pebble Plain Ecological Reserve. And those would be the Kennedy's buckwheat and the uh, gray ash um, paintbrush. Um, one thing we've noticed up here is um, in the past, we would only have to pick up after um, you know maybe two or three homeless encampments um, every, uh, every year. Now it's, we're doing about one a month and we seem to be having a lot more homeless issues um, on the mountain. So I just wanted to get Chris's um, intake, um, input on um, what your mission is uh, what your uh, ideas are for uh, working with the homeless issues because it is becoming uh, an issue, an environment issue, environmental issue, as well as a public health and safety issue. Absolutely. Thanks for asking the question. You know, I think uh, we all know that our homelessness crisis in California specifically, and that's, you know, closest to home and where we can sort of wrap our minds around it has gotten increasingly worse. And I think that this pandemic is presenting an opportunity because it's highlighting the fact that we need to solve our homelessness problem as a humanitarian issue, but it's also increasingly now a safety issue for the people who don't have a home to go to while we're all supposed to be sheltering in place. So to that end, I know that there have been some great people like Lisette um, Angulo, who's Basil Kimbrew, Chef Basil from Victorville's wife, and she's running for Victorville City Council. Roger LaPlante is also on the homelessness task force in Victorville. And the reason I mentioned the high desert is because I know that our mountain communities tend to have less of a homelessness problem because of the seasonality. It's very hard to be homeless in Mammoth or you know, in Big Bear. And so I think if we really address the problems locally, and one of the ideas that we have is we have plenty of land in the high desert. Could we find a public, private, or local, state, federal partnership that would allow us to build tiny houses, but also to have the wraparound services that people need? Because it's not as if, you know, People don't become homeless overnight and they don't come out of homelessness instantly. They need the kinds of support services to help them with whatever it was that caused them to become homeless in the first place. Quite frankly, that's often simply the loss of a job. But once you've lost the job and become homeless, the road back is not you get a job, you get an apartment and everything's fine. There's a process, there's been trauma. And so we have to make sure that people have all of those services in order to come back to a place where they had been prior to the event of becoming homeless. And so absolutely, I think that we're also seeing more and more in the desert, there are people who are sort of homesteading out there and there's challenges with that. They don't have access to running water. They don't have access to sanitation. And so we just need to find a way to work across agencies 
to make sure that we have opportunities for people, that there are jobs for them to go to, and that they also have the support they need to re-enter society. And when I say that, I'm talking about, you know, people who have been in the mountains, who are out in the wilderness, there's a definite process that we have to go through to help them, you know, um, for lack of a better term, like re-enter housing and get back on their feet. Indeed, thanks, Chris. Um, we have two last questions um, and then we're gonna wrap up. I've got one from uh, Seda Gazarian, school board candidate in Victorville. Um, Seda, you're on. Hi, Chris, it's good to see you. My um, question is actually from uh, for anyone on the citizens climate lobby as a high school teacher, I'm very curious about how our students can get involved uh, with your initiatives. Awesome. So actually, go ahead, Quentin. This is Quentin's on here. Um, I get your emails uh, from the Democratic uh, people. For, yeah, you're, and so I'll just uh, contact you or you can contact me. You're, I'm on your email list. Yes, you are, because you remember. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, um, we'd love to to get get them aware, and, and if they want to join on, you know, uh, it doesn't matter how old you are, you're a human being, and the reality is uh, uh, the high school students or the school students of today are going to be the ones that are going to be facing the worst of the climate change when it as it comes. And they're going to be around having to live with it, you know. Uh, Yep. The rest of us, well, I can speak for myself and my wife. We're getting, we're up there, so we're, you know, we don't have too many years to have to deal with it. So, but uh, I have grandkids, and uh, I want to make sure our my grandkids and everybody else's grandkids have a a decent planet to live on, a planet that basically we inherited and we despoiled, and so. Um, and I just found that uh, Citizens Climate Lobby to me was the most positive. Uh, you know, wanting to work with all parties, anybody, any politician from any stripe, conservative or, or, or progressive or in between, uh, that wants to work on this issue. Um, you know, we want them on board and uh, we, our, the plan that we have, uh, that's Bill 763, is really designed so that conservatives can get aboard. As long as they accept that climate change is happening and we have to do something about it, if they look at that and realize that we're not growing government because we're not putting money into the government, and I know a lot of progressives might have a problem with that, and that's fine. I don't mind the progressives putting something through on, you know, a Green New Deal type things, but this would be something that conservatives can get on board and support and uh, would not grow government, but would get us on the track of doing something about climate change. Yeah, and I'd add, this is Kaylin. I'd add in that um, last year when we went to CCO, we had students from Lee Vining and one student from Fallon, I believe, or the Victorville area. And it worked really well for yes. uh, all of us to go there together. So it would be awesome to work something out like that. For the I recognize Sabrina in the photo. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was really fun. Yeah, I'm, I'm, and Seda, thank you for the question because my dream is to have all of these incredible people that we have all across our district who are working on different parts of justice issues come together. So this is totally exciting. Mm -hmm. My plan is working. Great. And um, I have one last question from uh, Don Condit, also from CCL. Don, are you there? Don, go ahead and unmute. Star six, if you can. And if not, I've got an idea of what he wanted to ask the group about. And um, <clears throat> is that if anybody has been familiar with or involved with the Environmental Voter Project, this is something that is uh, really trying to mobilize environmentally concerned voters 
uh, active in some of the states that border us and not yet here in the eighth and we want to change that um, if anybody is connected or has been involved with that go ahead and mention it now and uh, we'll follow up and try to get that going here in the eighth uh, Chris Quinton again I I can get you the information uh, of who's doing it and uh, it sounds like they're doing some wonderful work sadly they're not working in California but uh, at least the ideas I mean they pointed out that uh, of people who identify themselves as environmental voters in 2016 only 50 percent of them voted that could that was eligible to vote voted and so you know, we need to up that. We need to make sure that environmental concerned people are voting like the gun rights people vote at like 98%. And so uh, that's very important. And, uh, you know, but it does take footwork. But um, um, anyhow, I can get that information right to you. And I saw it on the CCL when you were pulling up things to plug in on CCL. I saw the the person that did the presentation for them on that so uh, i could actually get his name right here right now it's sitting right here um hold on great and mike it looks like you uh had something to yeah. share about this as well yeah i mean i think the environmental voter project does a lot of good work and and it is a shame that they're not in california to do some of that work we had talked to them about um about their long-term plans and it makes sense. You know, their, their focus is, is on swing states, right? And, and areas that like, can make a big difference. But I think the, the other way to think about it um, is that they, they have a great way of, of mapping voters. And um, we've, we, along with National, have uh, done something very similar where you know, we can get a sense of who are our environmental voters based on a lot of consumer data and like and vote trend history. And, and there's a lot of information out there so you can help identify who's the most likely environmental voters that are out there. Uh, but one of, the thing, one of the other ways to think about it is that there are certain things that we know in general that can actually do something similar, at least in California, to what the Environmental Voter Project is. And that's really by increasing turnout in the demographics that we know are really strong supporters of, of env the environment and climate in general. And, uh, you know, you're talking about young voters. I think this entire call, um, this, this meeting was really about um, really focusing on the leadership of young leaders. Um, and, you know, it, it's not a coincidence that the only bill that we've sponsored in the last decade is a bill to actually help lower the voting age in this state because young people really have had a really huge impact and younger voters um, are continuously put the climate as one of their top issues. So if, if younger voters have a chance to really um, be out there and engage and be part of the process, um, you will see a, a drastic change because the a set of voters who are supportive. Um, I said to say that other demographics are not also supportive of climate. Um, it's, it's an easily growing issue. I mean, the environment is consistently one of the top issues, uh, especially in this, uh, in this primary season. Um, but uh, even though we, we can't uh, engage in, in uh, the Environmental Voter Project's um, uh, work in California because uh, they're not stationed here. Uh, you know, the, it, they're, they're a great group to work with, especially um, for a lot of the swing states. But you can continue their, the, the mission, I think, that we all really share, which is getting environmental voices out there um, by really helping turn out, turn out um, amongst the demographics that we know are really strong on the environment in general. Indeed. Thanks, Mike. I'm going to go ahead and turn it back over to Chris to wrap us up. Thanks, everyone, for staying, staying along with us. Yes, thank you so much. I just am so grateful to everyone who participated. You are the leadership of the environmental movement in the 8th Congressional District. I think we've talked about a lot of important issues. If, you know, as we go forward, not if, but when, I am your representative. I pledge that we will protect our water. We will stop things like Cadiz. We will make sure that when there's a geothermal plant proposed for Inyo County, that it gets the proper environmental impact review. Look, there's room for us to find new ways to harness the sun and the wind and geothermal opportunities that we have in this district, but it certainly doesn't have to be at the expense of our beautiful, pristine lands. There's plenty of ways for us to be creative to make sure that we're harnessing, 
you know, clean energy, but that we aren't causing unintended consequences. We know the result of that in our district. We want to make sure that we explore things like a carbon fee to reduce our dependence on fossil fuels. We're all thrilled with how clean our air is right now. And again, I think we had so many people say that this is an opportunity for us to see possibilities. Yes, this is a huge disruption. Yes, it's terrible what's happening to people economically. No one's taking that lightly. But if we have to go through this, let's have it be for a reason. And maybe that reason is that we can see what's possible for our planet. And finally, we just need to make sure that we protect our wilderness and federal lands. And I'm just going to close on the words of the incredible Kathy Bancroft. I wrote it down so I wouldn't get it wrong. How little would it take to heal this earth? Let's work together towards that future. And I'm just so grateful to all of you because I know that together we can get this done. So stay safe out there and let's keep going. Thanks. Good night, everyone.